Welcome to Reclaiming the Faith with Phil Baker, a podcast with a mission to reveal what the earliest Christians believed about the core issues facing us today. You can find links to all of Phil's resources at philsbaker.com. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen today and take a moment to share this podcast with your friends. Now, here's Phil. Well, this is episode 105 of Reclaiming the Faith, and in this episode, I am blessed to be able to interview Stephanie Quick, one of the producers of the amazing film Sheep Among Wolves, Volumes 1 and 2. Today, we're going to be discussing Volume 2, which is an inside look at the fastest growing church in the world, the Iranian Church. And if you want more information as to what's going on with the church in Iran and uh, how you can support the people there, please go check out sheepamongwolvesfilm.com where you can watch the film and find links to so many amazing resources. If you're blessed by this episode, please consider leaving a positive rating and review on my iTunes channel, Reclaiming the Faith. Also, if you want to become a Patreon supporter, uh, please check out my Patreon page, patreon.com slash philsbaker, where you'll get extra content there for $5 or more a month. Also, I am blessed to be a part of Omega Frequency along with BDK and Kurt, who are putting out great content every week. Check out the two YouTube channels, Omega Frequency Live and Omega Frequency, where you can find all of that content. And if you're not a subscriber, please go hit the subscribe buttons. And with that said, let's go ahead and get episode 105 rolling. All right, Stephanie, quick, thank you so much for taking time to be on Reclaiming the Faith today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what drew you to this topic of the um, the Iranian church? Well, so as you said, my name is Stephanie. I am a writer and producer serving with Frontier Alliance International. In I've been in the Middle East now for the better part of the last decade in the Turkish world, the Kurdish world, the right now I'm I'm in Northern Israel, I'm in the Golan Heights. So I've I've seen sort of the breadth and depth um, of, you know, this, this area of this little neck of the the Middle East. And we were introduced to, um, you know, the adage about Kevin Bacon, he's like, six degrees removed from everybody in the world. Everybody in the Middle East knows everybody. So we got connected to folks who are at this stage, you know, they, they might not use this kind of language because they're very humble, but um, are, are really being used by the Lord to spearhead the Iranian awakening. And so we, we are able to tell their story in a way that they're, they're unable to tell their story. And so we can kind of go public and make a film and, distort the voices, blur the faces, and and be the face to advocate for them as a, as a body of persecuted believers, but also just to tell their story. They don't need our, they are very, they don't need our help. (laughs) We were just kind of like, how can we encourage people with your testimony and how can we, um, or really raise, raise resources for you guys? How can we fund your leaders full-time or help get fund your leaders full-time. So we produced Sheep Among Wolves Volume 2. Sheep Among Wolves is is one of our film series that is a, uh, it's the chronicles of the persecuted church. And so, you know, every, we've got a few different, if 2020 wasn't 2020, you know, if the pandemic hadn't happened, the skies hadn't shut down, we probably would have put out an, at least another, maybe two more volumes of Sheep Among Wolves that we've got, you know, on our, on the back burner in pre-production, but, um, yeah, we, it it is the, that's sort of the business way to say it. The, the more human way to say it is, is the privilege of my life to be put in a position where I can ever encounter the Iranian church. They're just an incredible body of people. 
and truly, you know, the, the reason that we use the, the, this verse for the, the framework of the chapters in Sheep and Wolves 2 is, is that they are overcoming by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and not loving their lives, even at death. They're just, they're just incredible. So we are, we've learned so much from them. We are learning much from them. And, um, yeah, the Lord, we got to be in a, in a position where the Lord used us to serve them, which is a, a tremendous honor. Mm. Well, that film made a tremendous impact on me uh, watching it and uh, several of my friends as well who've seen it. Um, the film opens with an upside down shot of an Ar- Iranian city. Uh, well, why did you choose to open the film that way with this upside down shot? You know, there's there's a that language in Acts that the growing body of believers, the apostles were turning the world upside down. And really, the Lord is turning Iran on its head, and he's he's doing it through people, but and also he's just, he is coming to people and encountering people, and then they're like, I've, you know, I heard a testimony of one guy who was, the, the Lord came to him, I think in a dream, and dictated he, the entirety of John 1 to him, so he wrote down John 1. Wow. And then when some folks who did know the Lord already were led to him, he said, hey, man, I've been, I've been like having these encounters with this man. He's just telling me to write these things down. Do you recognize this? And he holds up what he'd been writing down. And it's John 1, you know. Wow. So, you know, as, as our Iranian brother says in the film, that the, the mosques in Iran are empty. Most Iranians, young, young Iranians, are, um, they don't want Islam. They've seen the underbelly of Islam and they don't want it. Um, so they are turning to what many disenchanted, disillusioned, depressed young adults turn to, which is drugs and suicide and all kinds of things. And so, um, I think that, that many in Iran are truly at the end of their rope and that's, that gets the eye of the Lord that's throughout the scriptures. He's with the oppressed, he's with the downtrodden, um, you know, when you're under the fist of the Ayatollah, you, you you could really be in a prime position to encounter encounter the Lord. So, mm. well, you just mentioned the Ayatollah, and um, uh, for those who don't know who or what I guess an Ayatollah is, right? Like, can you explain that for them? And then in the film, uh, you stated that the Ayatollahs are are the best evangelists for Jesus in Iran. So, like, why is that? Yeah, I, I you know, I should have double check my my dates before we hit record but late 70s there's the iranian revolution which sounds you know as an american you know, i use the word revolution it sounds like okay this is a good thing but it was um on a on a in a, in a lot of ways it was not a good thing but the lord can genesis fifty twenty, you know take what the enemy meant for harm and turn it into good out of anything. You can Romans 8, 28, anything. Yeah. And, and he's doing that with the Iranian revolution. But, you know, if you see photos of Iran, even Afghanistan, like back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, before um, the, you know, the dreams of the, the caliphate were recovered, you know, remember the, the Ottoman empire was the original Islamic caliphate. And that was, it imploded and it was carved up in the aftermath of World War I. So you have the entire Islamic world that's... Imagine the Catholic world not having a Vatican and not having a Pope. They would just be like, we had this North Star once, we had this compass once, and now we don't. And they probably really want to reinstate it. Mm. Um, and that's and that's what we're seeing in the Islamic world. So if you see photos before the Iranian Revolution, it was this window of time between the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the, and the institution of the Islamic... Republic of Iran, where, you know, an Iranian woman might have the same kind of hairstyle and clothes that my grandmother was wearing in the 60s, you know. And and so the the Ayatollah came in, and I'm just, I'm going to say on the front end, I'm not trying to like bluff my way through this. I am just not a, a geopolitical I'm not the historian at FAI. We have other people who do that kind of thing, but sure. but the the Ayatollah is a, a a leader in the Islamic Republic of Iran. The, the like, if I'm not mistaken, or confusing me, is like the supreme leader of, of Iran. So you you have this conflation of 
religion in the state, which is true, true, true Islam. The caliphate is a, is a theocracy and we're governed by the Quran. We're, we govern with the sword of Islam. You know, the jihad is, is a, a military endeavor in, in purest form. And, um, so the, the uh, there's one of our, our Iranian friends says in the film that the Ayatollah is one of the most effective evangelists in Iran because, like I said, that they're exposing the underbelly of Iran. Like now Iran has seen behind the curtain, you know, using the Wizard of Oz analogy. And they go, this is not peaceful. It's not uh, satisfying. And, and in fact, one of the testimonies of... Um, our, our one of our friend's wife, who's like such a catalytic disciple, she is an apostle in in Iran, very prophetic. Mm. She grew up radically committed to Allah and Islam, and was training to be a, a suicide bomber and jihad, like give everything, put everything on the line for Allah. She was so depressed and suicidal. Her mom was crippled with multiple sclerosis and um they decided together that they were going to do a, a dual suicide they're going to kill themselves together and i think the night that they were going to do it like one just kind of killing time or like trying to like you know get themselves into the headspace of doing it they started they were just watching tv and a christian program the satellite program that was beaming into iran came on and an evangelist was on TV and he said, listen, if you are, you're planning to kill yourself, don't do it. The Lord says, don't do it. So she calls him up, calls the hotline. She's like, it's me. And this is stupid. Jesus is st- every, like, I'm, I'm, I'm taking my life tonight. And he says, okay, cool. So you've given all of your life to Allah and it's left you with this. You've given him everything. He's given you nothing. So give Jesus one week. And you could at least say that you tried. Mm. So she's like, cool. Hangs up the phone. She's like, I'm going to call you in a week and kill myself in a week. But she wakes up the next morning and her mom, she hears her mom screaming. And she thinks, oh my gosh, the MS is spread. It's got her spine. She can't get out of bed. She runs out and she sees her mom walking down the hallway, completely healthy. Wow. So they go to the hospital and they get all these tests run. And the doctors are like, what imam did you pray to? How did this happen? Because mm. like, who, what, what imam did you go to? She said, we didn't go to an imam. We prayed to Jesus last night. And that was it. Just lit them up. So they start like, wow. like, you know, they, they said you could say Jesus and people would just come to the Lord. Like the Lord, that was, you know, certainly not the first time the Lord started to apprehend Iranian hearts, but it was the seedbed for the, the movement that's now sweeping through the country. And, um, you know, again, she, she, you have people who Iranians are looking for God. So she's an example of somebody who had given everything to the Lord, like wanted to give her life to God, but didn't know his name. Mm. And then once she discovered his name, you know, that's it. But she's all in there. They know what it is to be all in. Yeah. Even now, like as you're talking, I'm thinking of different ways that this, the Iranian church contrasts to the American church. Um, can you please discuss the methods of discipleship and church planning used by the Iranian Christians and how that contrasts to the West or the American church? Yeah, it, it needs to be um, highly reproducible, highly obedient to Jesus, and have the ability to stand on its own. Because what, many have had experiences where they, they you know, build a planet church, they draw a bunch of people in. And everything's cool and gravy until persecution comes. And once the heat and the pressure is applied, your converts collapse. They implode. They don't have the fortitude within themselves to stand on their own. And it was cool while it was cool. And then as soon as it stopped being cool, they're not in this thing. And, and it's this is, you're playing for keeps in Iran, you know, like this, it will cost you your life. So they started to ask the Lord, like, what, what do we do if we get imprisoned, if we get thrown in jail, then the people, you know, in our flock need to be able to stand on their own. So if you think about, I think the healthiest way to think about leadership in the body is not so much that pastors are shepherds or leaders are shepherds, but that we are sheepdogs. Mm. 
corralling. We are helping move the flock to the shepherd and protect the flock from wolves and, you know, threats and such. So they developed a method that uh, engages people in the word every week from the very beginning. You, this person is getting in the word and you might, you're doing it alongside them, but you ask these four questions. You read, say Genesis one, and then at the end of it, you say, what, what did this passage teach you about God? And they'll say, well, this struck me, you know, like we had a, a guy in Kurdistan who read it and went, huh, men and women were made equal in the image of God. Or no, that God made everything. First question, what does this teach you about God? God made everything. Second question, what is this, what is in light of that, what does that teach you about men? And he said, gosh, men and women are made equal in the image of God. Cool. So what are you going to do this week to obey what you just learned about God and man? He goes, I'm going to make my own bed. I'm not going to make my sister clean up after me because in Kurdistan, the girls clean everything. The boys don't do anything in the house. And he goes, but if we're equal before God, then there's no reason that she needs to be my maid. Now, then the fourth question is, um, who will you share this with? Hmm. You know, likely his sisters and mothers would be like, what are you doing? And he could share with them. So if he comes back on week two and you say, hey, how'd that go? Did you did you clean up after yourself? He goes, yes, cool. So he's in it. He's like walking in fidelity to what he, as God reveals things to him, because you're responsible for what, you know, to whom much is given, much has been required. So there's a, there's a law of stewardship, a principle of stewardship. If you're stewarding the revelation that the Lord gives you, then we keep rolling. But if you come back and go, no, I, I, you know, I wasn't really in the mood. I didn't obey it. I didn't share it with anybody. When that, now this person's, they're not in. If they don't want to, if they're not in, unlike the small costs, they're not in on the big costs. So then, you know, you know, I don't need to, I'll get coffee with somebody else. I'll read these stories with somebody else. And, and what that does is it for, if somebody's like, say you're doing it with them for a month or a week, whatever you have, even if you just have one session with them, they're going to remember, those are four easy questions. What did you learn about God? What did you learn about yourself? What did, how are you going to obey what you just learned and who are you going to share it with? Meaning if I'm doing this with my neighbor and then I get thrown in prison, they can stay on their own two feet. They don't need me to go through the word. I'm not telling them that they have to go to seminary before they can start to share this with other people. So they're immediately, before people even come to the Lord, they're sharing it with other people, which is what we see in the New Testament. When the Lord gathered the apostles, the disciples to himself, and he sent them out, the 12, the 70, two by two, these guys were like Judas was a disciple. He was called a disciple. He was being discipled and he was discipling, you know, mm -hmm. and that really shifted my um, everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, what does it mean to find Levi and go have dinner at Levi's house and hang out with his buddies such that the religious folks around you go, hey, are you are you like an alcoholic now? Because you're hanging out with all the folks who drink up too much. And Jesus can be like, oh, man, that's, I didn't come here for, like, the doctor doesn't come for people who are healthy. And, and if you don't understand why I came here, you're not going to understand why I'm sitting at the table with people who, you know, are in need of a physician and all of the symptoms of being in need of a physician. Of course, they also were in need of a physician, but um, it, it shifted something. It was really helpful for me to realize you don't, it, discipleship doesn't begin once you emerge from the waters of baptism. Discipleship is the journey that leads you to the waters of baptism. Mm. And some people, like Judas, don't go there. They don't want to. But you're recklessly scattering seed, like the parable of the sower. He's he's not worried about, well, that, that looks like stony ground. I'm not going to throw it there. Or that looks like maybe there's not enough depth or, you know. He doesn't, he's not checking the ground. He's not responsible for the soil. He's responsible for scattering the seed and he's just throwing it everywhere. And that's what we should be doing. Yeah, I think the, the line in the documentary is we don't convert to disciple, we disciple to convert. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. As you're explaining, you know, those passages in the gospel, like with Levi or with Zachariah, or not Zachariah, mm -hmm. Zacchaeus, um, that's mm -hmm. definitely the pattern that you see. And Jesus is even using people from the beginning, the 12 and the 70, they don't believe in the crucifixion and resurrection yet, but right. they're, they're following him and doing that, that work. The Spirit's using them right. in powerful ways. That's so right. good. Um, 
earlier you mentioned like the the main apostle in this in this movement is the woman who was going to to kill herself um and then her mom mm-hmm. got healed right um mm-hmm. in the in the movie it also or the documentary also says that like so many of the leaders in the Iranian church are women why do you think that mm-hmm. is uh, <laughs> ask myself this a lot actually because even you know it's just been true throughout history the church has, has been mostly female um even on the field, if you were to pluck a, a hundred laborers, 85 of them are going to be women. 10 of them are going to be married to some of the other women. I think, you know, 10 of the remaining 15 guys are going to be married to the women there. And then there'll be like five single guys, but you have this whole, you know, big group of, of women. And I think in the way that it's true of, foreign laborers that the Lord is drawing to the field in the way that it's true of indigenous laborers that the Lord is pulling out of, you know, on the field. Um, the Lord of the harvest send laborers. Sometimes that looks like he just raises them up within, you know, on the field itself. I think um, on one hand, it's like I said earlier that the Lord sees the oppressed and you know, one. I think it's Peter uses the language that we are, women are the weaker, the party between men and women. And I think it's because God and the apostle could acknowledge women are at a, a sociological, cultural, even just in terms of sheer human strength, at a disadvantage in saying, "Look, you need to advocate for the weaker party." That's 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 Christ-like, and and the Lord does that he's advocating for women and the wisdom of god is foolishness to the world and what we would strategize is shamed by the cross by the you know the wisdom of god in in executing himself on the cross in that the islamic world is steeped in seventh century patriarchy and misogyny so for the lord to elevate and use and give dignity and platform to women he's not only going after the most oppressed party he's doing a sign and a wonder before the powers and principalities of the air because the wisdom of god is foolishness to the world and um it, anna dalton's wife used just incredible language she and i were talking about it. she wrote an article about this and i think our oh gosh i think it was volume three of we do an annual field journal called pilgrim it's volume two or volume three and uh i think it's volume two it was the one that came out after she came out so whenever that would have been um about uh, like the sanctified feminist movement because the world sees and feels that kind of oppression and we are grasping at how to how to change how to fix it how do you come up against that kind of boulder that's rolling down a hill with all of the momentum behind it and say thus far and no more, we're going to dignify women, amplify women's voices, you know, all these things. If you do that from an unsanctified place, it's just as carnal as the original misogynistic patriarchal boulder that went rolling down the hill to begin with. It's not, it's not like the Lord, the Lord is spearheading a, a holy, righteous, and sanctified women's movement. And I think that the purest expression of sanctified feminism, what I've been, and I'm saying that to say not carnal, not not of the flesh, not driven and governed by wisdom from below, but, but shaped and shepherded by wisdom from above. The Lord is actually doing that in something like Iran. And I can't think of a more oppressive place for women in the world than the Islamic Republic of Iran. That's good. Um, it's also making me think of like God being a God of justice. And mm-hmm. so, um, like there are many who are last who will be first in the mm-hmm. kingdom. And, um, thinking about the, uh, the sermon on the Mount, particularly like Matthew five with like the beatitudes to really put those into practice, you, you, you have to believe in a God of justice. If you're not going to be mm-hmm. avenging yourself, if you're going to be depending on him, you know, vengeance is mine, says mm-hmm. the Lord, like Romans 12 stuff. You got to believe in a God of justice. And um, mm-hmm. so you've already hit, hit on some of this uh, in the interview already, but um, what, what role does the implementation of the Sermon on the Mount play in the growing church 
of Iran. And and I ask that because there are there's there's certain denominations that feel like certain, the certain amounts just hyperbole. And a lot of these denominations are, are based out of the, the West, you know, the Western church, not the persecuted church. And so they don't really see that as something now. They see that as stuff um, like in the millennial reign or something like that. It, it's kind of weird how they look at that. But how does the Sermon on the Mount play a pivotal role uh, in the growth of the Iranian church? The, implementation. the Sermon on the Mount is, you know, not officially, but I think fairly called the Constitution of the Kingdom. This is this is how we act. And like you said, if you believe in a God of justice, then it stands, it can hold water. And if God is not just, then you're really just throwing yourselves to the wolves. But if you know, like, every, everything hinges on whether or not you have a good dad in heaven who sees you. And if he sees you in the secret place, if he sees you in the hidden place, if he sees you when you're in your apartment in Tehran and your husband is beating you and you are fighting to forgive him mm. deep in your heart, you might not be able to get out of that apartment yet. You might not be able to get out of that marriage yet. And this, this is what will rattle me as like a single Western college educated American woman, you know, <laughs> power to the, you know, get her out of there. But some of these guys can't. And they are accessing something in Jesus that I have not yet touched because they can be in, in a situation like that and look at that man and forgive him and love him and serve him, not because they're um, confusing meekness with weakness and turn the other cheek means just beat the snot out of me and it's fine, which she knows when she goes to bed at night, when she wakes up in the morning, and when she's getting hit is this. God sees, God cares, and God will vindicate. But in the meantime, if you do not bow the knee, you either God will bear the weight of justice for what you're doing to me, or you will bear the weight of justice for what you're doing to me. And I want you to know him. I want you to stand next to me on the sea of glass. And listen, nobody is saying stay in an abusive relationship. All I'm saying is if you're stuck and you can't get out, Jesus is enough. And that's the testimony of Iranian believers. So this is why, you know, we, we in, in Sheikh Mawul's volume one and two, there are women who are indigenous believers in the Islamic world saying, I am staying here and not fleeing despite the risk of rape down the track. If I get caught, what they'll do to me, what they'll do to my body. And I have decided and some of these women are married and they've had the conversation with their husband. They've said, I have decided that I will present myself as a living sacrifice. And if being here and presenting a witness of Jesus and the gospel of the kingdom to my neighbors, to my community, to my country, that's under the oppressive thumb of Islam, the fist of Islam under the sword of Muhammad, then if I am jeopardizing myself and putting myself at risk, of that kind of abuse, then I decide to present myself as a living sacrifice and come what may, if I die, I die. But you're going to hear the name of Jesus. That's incredible. That's some, that's different <laughs> than, what, yeah. than what I grew up with, you know, or even that I would even be inclined to think, you know, whatever. It just, that was, I will, I'll never forget first hearing that interview. Yeah. Like to some of my, peers, you know, they would apply the word pacifism to that approach, but it doesn't seem like pacifism at all. It seems like they are at war. They're just fighting sure. in a different way, but they're very much have like a warfare, like military mindset. It's just different, mm -hmm. different means. Yeah. You know, and I think in the West, we, we, love the promises of vindication, justice, restoration, Sometimes we confuse those promises with now. Mm. Mo, you know, if we've got, if you have a wonky eschatology, you know your convictions, belief, theology about the end of this age, or you know some people would say the end of the world. I don't believe in the end of the world. I don't think it's biblical. If you think that the kingdom is here and now, or there is actually no millennium, it is all figurative. Mm. Like you know of. I am a Westerner. I came to faith in the West. I came to faith in, in Florida in a pretty big church. Um, so I'm not like this whole, I don't think that the whole system is like apostate and apart from God and he sure. can't use it. He's there. People are super faithful that, you know, leaders, congregants who love the Lord. I think that we have got 
to reckon with the scriptures as they relate to the end of this age and therefore justice, vindication, um, because it, inf- it informs how you walk through suffering now. And if you think that we're not supposed to suffer anymore, you're just not going to know how to respond to even something like 2020. You don't know what to do with that kind of global pressure. And, and the prophets tell us that it, the world is going to get to a point where it's buckling under the weight of sin. It's tottering like a drunkard on its axis. And 2020 is going to sound like a walk in a park when we're going through that day. So um, I'm thinking of George Mueller. Are you familiar with George Mueller? Mm-hmm. He's a, a contemporary of Charles Spurgeon, A.T. Yeah. Pearson, Hudson Taylor, Adolf Sapir. And um, George Mueller said to A.T. Pearson what somebody else, Hudson Taylor had the same kind of story, but he was in, in this case, he was in uh, Pearson's position. But Mueller and Pearson are on a train ride, and Pearson was uh, an amillennialist. And Mueller was like, he just leans into him and he goes, my dear brother, everything you've just said, all of the reasons why you think that we're all, like already in the millennium or it's this figurative thing or whatever, he said, I love you. None of that is in the Bible. Mm. And somebody said something similar to Hudson Taylor when he was a young man. He was, they were like, that sounds cool. That would be really convenient. It's not in the Bible. Yeah. And it wasn't that these guys went, oh, gosh, my friend told me that I was wrong and I just like switched my card out, you know, and now I'm part of, I'm like a card carrying premillennialist. That wasn't it. They went, huh, this guy knows me, loves me, cares about me. And and I know that he loves the Lord. So I wonder what it is. They had the humility to go, listen, if in fact this position is true, then I can go like truth can survive scrutiny. So I can go shake it and it'll hold up. Yeah. But if I go to the Lord is the rock, right? So if we blow on it from any direction, it doesn't move. Mm. And so Pearson, Taylor, you know, they hear this from their friend and they go, check out the word they rattle it and it does that bridge that they were putting all of their eschatological hopes on and even at that point this is informing how they preach the gospel it's informing how they make disciples it's informing how they walk through their own suffering in their own lives that bridge buckles it doesn't bear the weight and they go well they were right it's not in the bible you know? <laughs> but they had the humility to, to see that and that's why we saw you know, Mueller, Pearson, who were so involved in the student volunteer movement, Hudson Taylor, the China Inland Mission, student volunteer movement, Spurgeon, Pearson sir, outlived all of these guys. And he was there as the student volunteer movement started to shift from a blessed hope, Jesus, son of man appearing in the sky, coming in the clouds of power and glory. That That's our blessed hope. Uh, Titus 2, 13, I think. Um it started to shift and deviate from, well, you know, we don't need to like go and be abrasive. Like these folks in China, India, they've got, it's starting to get very anthropological in that we'll come and like give you a cup of water. We'll help you build schools, but we don't need to tell you what to believe. We don't need to, our religion's not like better or worse than yours, whatever. And this is because the world is trying to reckon with, a a conflation between missions and colonialism. Mm. And Hudson Taylor drew a line and said, we are not colonialists. We are going to go learn their language. We're going to eat their food. We're going to wear their clothes. Becoming yeah. a Christian, getting baptized and obeying Jesus from Nazareth does not mean you become an Englishman. Yeah. It cannot mean you become an Englishman. So we're going to lay down England. We're going to die to England when we depart from shores. And we are coming here to, we are becoming Chinese men and women. Mm. You know, I don't mean this on like a cultural appropriation way, but they're like, sure. we're all things to all people. Right. They are going to stand on the sea of glass and speak to the Lord in their Chinese dialect. And we love that. We honor that. And we are going to learn that tongue now and preach the gospel to them in their their tongue now. They were not colonialists, but the student volunteer movement is this era of, you know, this wave of young adults hitting the field, leaving Ivy League schools, packing their stuff in coffins and going to the field in the 1800s. And then it splintered at the threshold of coming into the 20th century because it started to get drunk on what is really common theology in the West today, that we are standing on the promises of the kingdom now, and Jesus just wants to give everybody a hug, and there's no wrath to come that we have to worry about, and you can bow them and you're not. It kind of doesn't matter, but do you want do you want some water? We'll give you some water. We'll put it on Instagram, hashtag blessed. Wow. You know? And the Lord, he's He's going to take this lukewarm body of, of 
American believers and rattle us enough that we are either going to go cold or go hot. Everybody, we're all, that's the T, the juncture that every believer in America is coming up to now. Hmm. Because the Lord is saying, look, we don't have time to goof off anymore. I am coming on the clouds in power and glory. And when the Son of Man comes, Luke 18, will he find faith on the earth? Right. Man, that's, that's really good stuff. That's really good stuff. Um, thinking back a few minutes, you were talking about uh, the necessity of meeting people where they are, like Hudson Taylor, mm-hmm. learning the Chinese language and dressing like them and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've heard stories uh, of how one of the main ways that, that God reaches Muslims is through like dreams and visions because that's something they're already very receptive to. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, I, I, I don't know the why behind it, but certainly there's a, a lot of dreams and visions. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's quite common. So, like, in addition to that, like, what role do you think, um, or how how do miracles play a role in the growing Iranian Iranian church? And you've already hit on some of that, but I wonder if you can maybe share a couple more stories. Yeah. If you, you know, and again, if anybody wants to watch this film, it's free online. It's on YouTube. You can search Sheep Among Wolves too. And again, as you know, they, they teach them by immediate experience, how to get in the word and hear from the Lord and, and implement what you hear from the Lord to obey the Lord. Because if you can be faithful in the small, you can be faithful in the big. Yeah. And if you learn to hear the Holy Spirit, you know, in like a, you know, because these guys are really, when they get up in the morning, they're praying, Lord, where do I go today? And if he says go to that coffee shop, but do not go to that coffee shop, if you don't listen to him and you go to the wrong coffee shop, you get arrested. You could get arrested. You mm. know what I mean? And maybe one day the Lord will lead them into that kind of thing. Because there were times in Paul's life where the Lord spoke to him and said, don't go down that road. They're going to, arrest you. And then later he said, Paul, your time has come, you know? So I'm not saying that he like always ninja senseis you out of harm, you know, but um, as people begin to get in the word and read stories about God and learn how to hear God and obey God, ultimately they're the the, the disciple maker who's discipling them is literally praying and fasting that God would break into this person's life with a power encounter because that's what holds you and keeps you. If you meet him, I remember hearing this story like in 2008, the, I was in a, an internship and the internship director had had a meeting with the pastor of a really like one of the largest churches in Cairo. And he was saying this, this Egyptian pastor was saying to my program director, you know, you have all these young Egyptians come. He said, I have all these young Egyptians coming into my office saying, I, I want to, I, 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 Muslim background, born and raised Muslim. And I, I'm a Christian. I met Jesus and I, he, and he's like, okay, but do you understand that if you get baptized, what this means? You change your, your like governmental ID, your paperwork, you change from Muslim to Christian. This has massive repercussions on your life. It's not a casual thing. You can't change your mind tomorrow morning or next week and go back, flip around. Do you know what you're doing? And he said, I asked them all this question because I, I have to. I don't want them coming in here and like haphazard, like not knowing the cost. I want I want to know that they have counted the cost. And they, he said, the most common response I get is this like kid sitting across his desk looking at him going, have you, have you seen him? Mm. And he's like, yeah, like, what? Go, have you seen Jesus? And he goes, no, I haven't. And they said, yeah. And again, he said this conversation, look, see, here's the select. They go, yeah, I suspected that you've never seen him because if you had, you would not be asking me this question. Mm. You know? And there are so many testimonies included in Sheep and Mongols too that, I mean, I don't want to ruin them. Just incredible. These folks are like the thing about it that's really incredible is that they, they, it's not just that they like, you know, meet the man in white and go, wow, there's something about him that's different. He's got these eyes of fire. It's that he knows them and he comes to them in a way that only they would know this matters or I needed to hear this from you or I needed, you know, whatever. There's a, a testimony of a gal who was trying to take her own life and, you know, ties the noose, gets her neck in it jumps or she thinks that she jumps because now she's having a dream where she's standing on jesus shoulders Hmm. 
and he's reciting Psalm 91 to her. She doesn't know Psalm 91. Mm -hmm. And she feels, for the first time in her life, she feels safe. Not only safe, but safe with a male presence, which is, you know, with her background, with her story, she, would, she wouldn't she would have. Mm. But she's standing on this man's shoulders. He's, he's speaking Psalm 91 to her. She feels so safe. And he says to her, I'm always with you. I'll never let you go. And she wakes up laying in her bed, and she goes, oh, my goodness, what a powerful dream. I must have just kind of hallucinated the whole thing thing and she stands up she looks in the mirror and she's got a black mark around her neck mm. you know what i mean that kind of thing. yeah <laughs> that's signs of mere wonder like that's we don't have language for what that is but the lord is so personal and so thoughtful and that girl you can you could come to her with guns what whatever like come to her with the news we're gonna kill you she, fine. I don't care. You know who I'm going to be with? The one whose shoulders I sat on. I don't care what you do to me. Yeah. So I, I, sh I was showing my, my 12 year old, this documentary last night, my, my daughter, um, and my wife and I were like, we were watching it all together. I'd already seen it, but, um, just wanted to show them. Um, and my daughter was a after that particular scene, she's like, dad, why, why are they not scared? I'm like, I, I don't think they're not scared. I think there's courage going on, doing the right thing, even if you are scared. But like mm -hmm. you being the producer of the film, if you were sitting in that room with my daughter and she said that to you, how would you have responded? Perfect love casts out fear. And, and they've encountered him. They didn't. They, you know what I mean? Like they, they, they're living a, a different experience in God than I have had. I've not had encounters like that. Um, but I think, yeah, they, they have such a, uh, their eyes are truly on eternity. Like it's like they can look in front of them and see the secret police or they can see the IRGC or they can see the Ayatollah, but then right behind them on the horizon, they see eternity. Mm. And they're like, what, you know, like I, one of our, our brothers says in the film, he's like, what is 50 years in prison compared to eternity with Jesus? Hmm. And I hear that and I'm like, bro, it's 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long time. Yeah. But um, I, I don't know, man. Perfect love casts out all fear. That's awesome. Well, just thank you again, Stephanie, for taking the time to do this. Um, yeah, just wanted to ask you, last question, can you remind folks um, where they can go to watch it and maybe how they can support um, the mission and um, any kind of final words of encouragement or exhortation for those listening? Yeah, thank you. You can go to sheepmogulsfilm.com and I, I want to say that they... Yeah, go to supermodelsfilm.com. That's that's our landing page. And then you can find ways to get trained by these guys mm -hmm. and hear from them how to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Um, and we we're just the that that site's kind of the traffic police. So then you can go there and and also, you know, if you want to support these guys and help release them full time, fund them full time you know, the leaders of, of the movement in Iran, um, then you can do that there as well. Uh, anything else? We, we do have a, two things that FAI offers for free. We have an app that has all of our, it's, it's the central location for all of our content, our films, our podcasts, our TV shows, our music, our Bible teaching, everything is in the app. You turn on notifications, you'll know as soon as things come out. The second thing we have is our Telegram channel, which is different in that it's like just real-time updates from our guys on the field. They go to a clinic in Kurdistan, you'll get photos, video, you'll hear from FAI personnel about the FAI family in a way that you can't on social media, we can't on social media, and, and is like too run and gun for the app. The app is we produced this thing and now it's in the app, you know, the telegram channel is like, sup guys, we're at a clinic today. Yeah. So, um, those, at all, and all of that is free. So. Mm. Praise God. Wow. That's great. Thank you again. Yeah. Anytime. Thanks so much.
waited so long Pressed in in tears We weren't alone Mercy was near When they doubled their hate You tripled your love Feeling so great, but greater was God. But trembled as fear mocked us each day. The sword in his spear. Stood in our way And you sent a child Faith and a rock Feeling so great Greater was God Mother and dad followed their lead. Listened to death and ate from that tree. Then you sent your son. A curse met his cross Feeling so great But greater was God 